Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always to start the new year with the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? I'm real good. I just, listen, I figure start off, we're getting up there in years. Or should I say, should I say Teddy Hollywood Atlas? Just trying to be like you, brother. Um, <laughs> you know, I figured enough years have gone by with 20. 24 god bless everyone happy new year i want to be like ken right i want to i want to i wanted the cool factor i wanted to um <laughs> i just want to upgrade my coolness and i figured maybe this is you know superficial but i figured it might be one way to upgrade that coolness and get on board with ken you know, I I can't for the fans for the fans who are just listening. Teddy has on beautiful gold aviator sunglasses. My sons, they're not mine, but boy, my son has good taste. I I borrowed them from him, and I'm like, wow, they they were paying you good at the NFL, huh? Wow, they, <laughs> Teddy Jr. always has an elevated look with his Louis Vuitton backpack, Air Jordans. He never misses a beat. He's a classy kid. He. He knows uh, he knows how to conduct himself and how to carry himself, but um, I'll tell you, he's got nice sunglasses, and I, <laughs> I, I, I might get comfortable with these. He might have to get himself another pair. But for it, it's not just the cool factor; it's uh, the real factor that I'm wearing them out of need and necessity. Now, I know some people out there are going to think, oh, something happened yesterday. He came out of retirement. <laughs> he came out of retirement. and uh, One of the neighbors parked in front of Teddy's spot that he shoveled out in front of his house. Know, the, the, he didn't move his head enough. Uh, you know. <laughs> but no, look, I'm going to take him off for a second, and then I'll put him back. You understand, as you can see, uh, I have... Um, what is, I, I don't know what the formal name is, conjunctivitis or whatever it's called. Conjunctivitis. Yeah, conjunctivitis. People call it pink eye. Uh, it's a beautiful gift from your grandchildren. Uh, my grandson from Las <laughs> Vegas came over and, and granted it to me. The, I love my grandchildren. They, they never stop giving. <laughs> when you have when you have kids around, you're gonna get you're gonna get sick. If they get sick, you get sick. And um, especially when you love them the way we love them, and you sleep with them, and you kiss them, and you snuggle with them, and everything else. So, I got that, and then that wasn't enough. That's not enough for Teddy Atlas in 2024. I also got a severe sinus infection that the great Dr. Jody Brown, the best ophthalmologist in the country from Kentucky. He uh, over the phone. He gave me he gave me a prescription for antibiotic. Uh, for th for those of you that watch the show regularly, you know that I have a problem. I I've deviated symptom for my God forty something years since I was fighting, and it only got worse. It got compounded. It got worse, and I'm supposed to get surgery. So maybe this finally nudges me in that direction to get the surgery because I have chronic nasal infections all the time, which just causes the problem that I'm sure some of you are very well aware of, where sometimes I'm doing that. I'm making noises with my nose because I can't breathe. So maybe it, <laughs> maybe it moves me into that area a little faster. But as Dr. Brown, the great Dr. Brown said, I just got hit with a perfect storm with with everything all at once. And uh, between a nasal infection, I got a ear, something going on, uh, and, and I got this thing with my ear. So I'm going to put them back on. I don't want people getting grossed out uh, because they, they don't look so nice. And uh, maybe we'll stick with this look. Who knows? Maybe we'll stick with this. Uh, or maybe... You know, maybe there's some fans out there that say Teddy uh, Teddy made a deal with that bad guy, that bad guy, you know, with the that guy with the, the devil. Maybe he made a deal with him, and uh, that's why his <laughs> eyes look so demonic. Uh, or maybe, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I, maybe, maybe they always look demonic, and you never noticed. I don't know. Uh, hopefully they won't look demonic anymore. We'll get rid of them with these 
medications that the good doctor gave me, and uh, or maybe you'll find out later that I did make a deal, that I didn't make a deal with that guy, <laughs> and and uh, I start I start throwing some stuff out there. Maybe maybe there's people out there that think I need to make a deal with the devil uh, because of my bad picks uh, last week. Maybe they <laughs> maybe maybe I was. Maybe they're going to say, Teddy, you were tempted to make a deal, huh? So you don't get tortured by us fans saying how horrible you were with those picks. Listen, I'm going to answer that real quick. Uh, I made a couple quick bad picks and you guys jumped on me. Uh, for Obviously, I, I took uh, Wilder and I went against Joshua. I took Whalen. Terrible picks, no doubt. But how quickly they forget... Uh, you know, it's funny. Maybe we'll move the page. We'll turn the page in 2024. We'll be more forgiving. Uh, we'll have late, less H people out there. You know what I mean by H? Hate, haters. Uh, maybe we'll get better <laughs> that way because you jumped all over me, and that's fine. That's your prerogative. I get it. But did you forget that a few people have told me and they've calculated it pretty closely that I have about an 85% win percentage? That don't mean nothing. I get it. What have you done for me lately? I get it. But the one thing I got a kick out of, Ken, was they all came out to jump all over me that I got these terrible picks, which I did. And, of course, they forget the good ones. And that's that's human nature sometimes. The funny thing that I had to laugh, and my, even my son laughed, was that... You guys got over 100,000 views on that show like this uh, that week. And, <laughs> and, and, and they're all coming out saying how horrible you are picking. <laughs> and meanwhile, there's 100,000 of them coming to hear what else you're going to say, <laughs> what you're going to pick next week, coming, coming to hear what you're going to say about the other things uh, that are in the boxing world. So, Dad, keep picking them bad. Keep picking them bad because people are coming out of the walls to hear stuff again. And meanwhile, you pick a band, they come out, and and you get a hundred thousand in a blink of an eye. So, and we got over three hundred thousand subscribers. Listen, in all seriousness, and then I'll let Ken take over. But thank you guys for twenty twenty three and all the other years. Thank you, really. Happy New Year. God bless you all. I hope you get everything you want in the New Year. Most important, keep your health. Uh, and maybe one New Year's resolution that I would make right now. And I don't think it's a bad one. Maybe, maybe along the lines of, you know, what I was touching on, that maybe for the new year, we're we're just we're, we'll be a little better at not forgetting the good things that people have done for. I got to get better with this. So this is going to be my resolution. I'm going to get better at forgetting. Maybe the things I don't like that woman, as long as they're not too severe, then that's too. Then you're dead. You're finished. You're done with me. But but <laughs> forgetting the mistakes that people have made, where they've disappointed me a little bit, and I'm sure I've disappointed other people, many people, uh, many times. And I try to get better at that. And I also try to get better at trying to forgive the little mistakes they make if they're not too big, <laughs> and most important, not forgetting the good things. You know, just because there's some things that weren't so good, don't forget the good things that people have done for you. I know I fall into that category sometimes where I get mad at somebody and that's it. And then I forget that two years earlier, three years earlier, 10 years earlier, six months earlier, whatever, they did something really good for me and really nice for me. And I'm going to ask everybody, that would be my resolution for everybody, that we don't forget the little good things that people have done for us over the years, and that gets wiped out by the mistakes they've made. We, we, try, not to, we try not to let that happen. That's a good point. And one thing I would say along those lines, because I tend to do similar things, is if I feel like someone has aggrieved me in some way, it's very easy to not consider the other person's actions and just say, F them, they did this, they did that. But a lot of times, things that you may perceive as a slight are actually a character fault of the aggriever, and they're not personal. It's just, oh, I made a mistake there, but it wasn't personal. I didn't mean to 
be slight you. It shows maybe a weakness in my own character and something I have to work on, but it can be perceived as a personal slight to the uh, other party. Nevertheless, um, the one thing I wanted to mention about the haters is real quick, because some fighters in particular, if we pick against them, like in this case, case Anthony Joshua, the people that are fans of Anthony Joshua get so incredibly upset and, and literally angry. And I just want to say, if you think that we personally dislike Anthony Joshua, you're insane and you're not paying attention. I actually like him. I think he's a good representative of the sport. I'm a huge fan. And God forbid I give an opinion that he might not win this fight and I give my rationale or reasons and, and Teddy gives his rationale and reasons. But my God, the hatred that comes out like... As you're typing this to the haters, like, just think about it. Does it say more about me or you that you'd be that upset because my p opinion doesn't align with yours? I don't dislike you. I don't have a problem with you. But all of a sudden, because you don't agree with my opinion, you hate me and I'm inept and I'm a piece of crap. Think about what you're saying, man. Take a deep breath. Find a hobby. Like, No, I got you. And, and, uh, and you know, the thing I've touched on since you're about you know, giving our opinion, it's just an opinion. Yeah, I have 50 That's years it. of experience. I'm not saying I'm right. It's my opinion. I'm, I'm basing it on a lot of experience, but it's my opinion. And, and it's Ken's opinion. And the last thing I say is just to, I guess, to put a little qualification to some of the things I had to laugh when how quick, you know, you, and again, rightfully so, I picked some bad picks. But you forget about uh, when I when I had told you guys that Crawford would not only win against Spence, but that he would not come out. You forgot that one. Uh, I said that, and, and I think I might have been the only person out there, really, who said this next one, where Naganyu had a chance against Ty Well, you forgot that one. Okay, no problem. I'll run through them real quick. You know, uh, you, you forgot that one. You forgot when I said that uh, Bevo... Uh, would win easy over Canelo? Yeah, you forgot that one. Or that Uzik would beat Joshua uh, in their two fights? You forgot those. Uh, or that Canelo would stop Plant and Saunders? Um, most people thought Canelo would win, but they thought it was going to be tough fights. And I never thought it would be even competitive fights. Uh, you know, or how about what Teofimo uh, Lopez... Uh, was beat Josh Taylor. Uh, many of you were on the Taylor bandwagon at that point, right? He was still undefeated. Or way back when, way, way back when I was, I think the first one, Ken, but one of the first ones to say that Tank Davis, now I know he's changed his name, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I don't know if it's Abdul, whatever it is, but I'm going to refer to Tank Davis until I get his name correct. And, but I'm going to make the point that I know that he became Muslim and, and took, over, took a Muslim name uh, recently. Wait a minute. It did, did, wait a minute. He really did. I, I have not heard that. Javonta Davis changed yeah, his name? Yeah, he really did. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I honestly yeah, hadn't heard no, that. No, that's why we full, we, we have conversations here. We're, we're human. But we always try to be as open and candid as possible. And... And, and transparent, and like we are right now. But yeah, so I want to make sure I give him his due respect that he changed his name. And while you're looking at that, I'll just go down my, you know, my Christmas list, my laundry list that I made real quick. Um, but I had said that Tank Davis at the time was the best fighter out there in that weight class. Everybody jumped all over me like, what are you kidding? He's just a banger. He's a one-dimensional. No, no. I was pointing out way before he was a one-dimensional banger that he was a complete fighter, as good as anybody. And I think the best of that weight class. So uh, anyway, way back. How about way back to, if you really want to go back, and I'll leave you with this one, Ken, to the rematch. How many years ago was that? Between Tyson and Holyfield, right? When I predicted, and people are going to question it. People are going to say, come on, you didn't do that. Google it. New York Post story, Jack Newfield, two days after the fight. I predicted at Jack Newfield's uh, party at his Greenwich Village uh, townhouse uh, in, in Greenwich Village, Manhattan, with about 50 people there, they asked 
The fight was that night. I was leaving, going to go home and watch the fight with my wife. And everybody was asking me, who do you predict in the, in the rematch with Holyfield and Tyson? And I said, Holyfield's going to win by DQ. Yeah, that's right, disqualification. That might have been one of the greatest picks of all time, and nobody even knows about it. <laughs> and again, people are going to say, come on, Teddy, you couldn't have done I did. And I'm not going to get into the particulars of why you guys could figure that out. Spend 2024 figuring that out. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> let that be. Let that be one of your uh, one of your missions for 2024. And I'm kidding. You got more important stuff to do than that. But that was a pretty good prediction. So anyway, let's move on. Did you get his? Uh, did you get his name? His, uh Did you find some on on tank? Yep, he's converted to. Uh... Islam and is Abdul Wahid. Oh, there it is. But he hasn't changed it on Twitter yet. It's okay. still it's the name's still Javonta Davis on Twitter. I would think that'd be the first place you change it. But hey, good luck to him. Um, you know, following in the footsteps of the great Muhammad Al Kashis Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. So hope it works for him and wish him all the 100%, best. Of 100%. course. Um I all right, that's that's gold. Let's get into this. One fight on the docket to discuss. Noya Inoue gets a 10th round stoppage over Marlon Tapalis. Um, just a beatdown. Knocked him down in the fourth round. Looked awesome against him every step of the way. A typical, uh, for me, very typical um, Inoue performance. One-sided, totally in control. He did get caught a couple of shots, but again, he's in there with theoretically the best guys in the world. This was at 122. New, uh, a new weight class for him, I believe. Um, so in a way, adds another world title, a unification fight. Yeah, listen, I disagree with you right off to start. Why, why not start 2024 the right way? I disagree with Ken. <laughs> uh, that, that, why, why should we do it any differently? No, I agree and I disagree. Where I disagree, he looked human. In a way, there were spots where he looked more human than he has in the past, that, that it wasn't uh, the spotless performance that we're used to seeing him. He's great. But he almost, he had his Clark Kent moments and then he went into the phone booth and he came out as Superman. That's in a way. There's two special, special fighters in our time. The greatest, they, they match any era, any era. And I have trouble saying that usually because I think the era of the 20s, 30s, 40s was the greatest because you had everybody fighting everybody. You had some guys having 200 pro fights, uh, sometimes more. So... And you're never going to have an error like that. But there's certain guys I think Sugar Ray Leonard uh, can fix in any error. I think Pernell Whitaker can mix in any error. I think, uh, you know, a lot of guys. I love I love Mayweather. Um, but in a way, and Crawford are the two elite fighters right now. And in a way, there was a few bumps in the road. Uh, in this fight with a very capable Tapalis who's a champion and is already at two belts. Uh, he's from the Philippines, like the great Pacquiao. He He's a southpaw. He's he's buttoned up, covers up real well. He's aggressive. He doesn't give you a lot of talk. He blocks really well. Uh, he, he changes his distance well. He's trickier than he looks. There's more than what meets the eye to him. He's trickier than he looks. Uh, and in a way, showed his greatness in eventually knocking him out, stopping him in the tent, and slowly taking him apart because he took apart a really good fighter and did have moments where, as Ken touched on, he got tagged a little bit more than we're normally used to seeing him get tagged, and especially with uppercuts where Tapley's split his guard on the inside uh, with the uppercut where, in a way, didn't use his head movement. As much as I've seen sometimes, he's very good at controlling range, very good at uh, timing you. He He's obviously very versatile. He can go get you, which he likes to always apply pressure and melt you down, but he can also counterpunch and time you beautifully. Uh, again, not a perfect perform, but where it was perfect for in a way was in the end. There was only one guy who was going to win this fight. He showed his greatness and confidence, supreme confidence, supreme bull. He never got thrown off. And that you never had a doubt that he'd get to him sooner or later. And he did. And he got to him. 
uh, his strengths in a way, hand speed, eyes, vision, calmness. He sees everything, just like Crawford. He sees everything. Everything slows down for him. He sees everything. And supreme confidence. They just doesn't believe there's a human out there that could beat him. And his feet. He showed me again, reminded me of how good he is with his feet. Like a young Lomachenko, like a younger Pacquiao, where he could close gaps. And that's what he did with Tapolis. He closed gaps so, so fast. Really, so fast and explosive. He's so great at that, besides everything else that he does. So he reminded me of that part of his arsenal, his repertoire. And I'm glad he reminded me of that. Uh, you know, he's, he, he's a complete guy. And uh, it's amazing, the audience, isn't it, Ken, out there in Japan, how, just how the antithesis from here, how quiet and polite they are. It's like strange, right? It's like they fight in a, they're, they're, it's a sold-out arena, but it's quiet. It's like you're fighting in a vacuum. Like you're you're fighting in an opera house, <laughs> where the the Japanese are just such they're they're just such polite people, and and their culture is attached to just you know having manners and respect and everything. And uh, it's just it's funny to see a great fighter like that, and it's you know it's not as loud as it would be, of course, if it was somewhere over here. But at the end of the day, like. Uh, like Joe Pesci said in the movie, My Cousin Vinny, I'm through with this guy. You know, in other words, I, I, I'm done. That's enough. I, I think I covered, it, I, I covered it enough. Let's move on. But in a way, yeah, he had some, there was some bumpiness uh, to his last fight in uh, 2023. But in the end, his greatness, for all the reasons I just said it, uh, prevailed. Uh, and, and he even adjusted. I love the way he adjusts. If he's got to adjust, Ken, he adjusts. He adjusts some of his punches where he couldn't catch Tapolis clean. He was hard to catch clean. So what did he do? He adjusted the punches behind the ear, behind the gloves a little bit. And then the final punch that he knocked out, that he stopped uh, Tapolis with, was really, <coughs> it, it almost gets overlooked. He blinded with the jab and shot the right hand right down the middle. There was just a little space uh, in between a, his gloves, that police, because he blocks his gloves almost like a peekable style. And it was just a little space down the middle. And he's got the speed in the eyes and to do it. And that's what he did. That's exactly what, in a way, he did. He, but, he, but he did one little thing different. He left the jab out there just a little millisecond longer and then hit him with the right hand on the temple. And the reason he did that, he knew he could do it. He was calm enough to do it. And he knew by doing that, he would fully blind Tapolis to seeing a punch. And it would have that effect on such a tough guy. And that's what he did. Uh, he blinded him by leaving a... Uh, very few guys, they leave the hand out there, they get counted. He was able to leave it out there, not get counted, know that he could get away with it, left it out there just long enough where he never saw the right hand. It was marvelous. Uh, you mentioned it. He stepped up in... Uh, it's, I mean, he stepped up in a couple weight classes. He now he now has all the belts at um, Junior Federer. Yeah, he's... He, um, all four of the major yeah, belts. Yeah, he's, he's only the second guy... In the history of the of really the four belt ever, I don't know how long it's been around, but he's only the second man in the history of the four belt era to consolidate all four belts, uh, hold all four belts in a weight in two different weight classes. Now that's two weight classes he's done that. That's that's really remarkable. And uh, the only other well, don't forget he had he he had them all at Bantam, and then he had two of the four at uh, Super yeah, Bantam. Yeah, I mean he stepped up, and now he's got them all at Junior. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, Su Super Bantam. Yeah, he here. stepped up. I don't know how many weight classes, three, four, whatever it is. For well, you should actually look at it while I'm finishing up here to see exactly to our fans exactly how many weight classes. But he's the first. He came from light fly. Yeah. So he's the understand. first guy, while you're calculating that, he's the first, he's the second man to consolidate all four belts in two different weight classes, Crawford being the first one to do it. He's the other guy. And the next guy to do it, if he wins against Tyson Fury, 
would be Usyk. So he started at, um, Inoue started at flyweight, which is 112. He won titles at light fly. And then won titles in every weight division as uh, going forward to current junior, junior featherweight. He was light fly. Then he won the super fly. Man, this guy's won belt. Then he won the bantamweight title. And, and, the, and that's the only Bantam. thing that could probably stop him is how many weight classes can he go? Because you know it does Super it does Bantam. become a a certain point of, you know, how far can you go? How many weight classes can you like? Loman Checker went all the way up, you know, from featherweight uh, to junior lightweight to lightweight. Never he he really couldn't go any higher, and he's getting old now getting older but that's going to be the thing is how many weight classes can in a way go up that's that's going to be an interesting part of his quest, uh, career 108 to 122 which doesn't sound like a lot of weight but when you calculate it on a percentage of body weight it's a huge move up and uh, yeah it is as a percentage Oh, it is. And those guys are competitive at that weight class. They're fast. There tends to be very Well, you know, with your tight. own kids, with children and peewee football and stuff, really, uh, all the fans out there can relate to what I'm about to say. You see, when your kids go from weight, one weight class to another, one, you know, one division to another, you see the difference. You, you see the kids are bigger, they're stronger, you know. So, uh, all right, let's... Let's, let's go, Mr. Cool Breeze. Next up, I'm let's Mr. get a cool. preview of the- I'm Mr. Cool. How you liking him? How you like him? I don't think my I son's going to get him back. I don't think he's getting him back. <laughs> let's make bets on the new year. How many people think my son's actually going to get these back? These these bad these bad boys, like my grandson Joseph would say, these bad boys. How about, you know, and, and I'll little tell you Teddy exactly what's going to happen. Teddy Sr.'s keeping those glasses, but he's going to send uh, Teddy Jr. back with a gift card to replace them. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't make you know Tadamas, but uh, <laughs> you know, or the Mason Kreskin, but you might know, you might have, you might be on to something. All right. What are we on to? What are we on to here? Uh, preview for the upcoming fight. Virgil Ortiz back in action after five month layoff, last seen in August. Um, when he knocked out Michael McKinson in the ninth round, he is in with the Ghana fighter Frederick Lawson um, in Vegas. Super welterweight fight, twelve round bout. What are you looking for out of um, young Virgil Ortiz? I love this guy. You know, what is he? Twenty five now. Uh, you know, he's not twenty five years yeah, old. Yeah, he, he's had a lot of serious health issues. I'm glad he's back, and I hope he's okay. He's had a. He's really been sick over the years. He's had some serious stuff, some real serious battles with COVID when it first came out, uh, even to the point where it was affecting his kidneys. Thank God he's back. Thank God he's healthy from all reports. And, uh, you know, he, he he's 19 and old with 19 knockouts. He's been inactive now, uh, you know, for a little bit. He's to bring him back. Let's see. His, uh, he last fought August of 2022. So that's how long he's that's been right. out, and um, he's moved. Oh, sorry, I said five months. I I, I misread the number. You're right. It was a, a year and five uh, months. Yeah, I that's why saying. you got me here. I knew that's you why said, you got yeah. me here, yep, kid. That's, right. that's you know I I back that's you up. Right. Um, right. He's now moving up. And by the way, he had a serious aside from the two COVID battles. Most recently, he was hospitalized with it with an ailment called rhabdo. Myolysis, which is a breakdown of muscle t- muscle tissue resulting in the re- release of myoglobin into the blood. Very serious yeah, that's um, what ailment that required hospitalization. Oh, he's been very so, sick. Thank yeah, it was God. in addition to two bouts of COVID. No, thank God. That's why I said he said he's had a couple. He's got a, a myriad of problems, health issues, not just COVID, but COVID was the beginning of it, and. Um, He's now moving up from welterweight to 154 pounds, junior, you know, junior middleweight. And uh, with all this inactivity and all the health problems, he's coming back, and he's with Golden Boy with De La Hoya. And, you know, they picked, uh, they think they picked the right guy. No different than they 
felt they picked the right guy for Ryan Garcia when he came back after his inactivity, after being knocked out by Tank Davis. Um, they, uh, they picked Frederick Lawson, who's 34 years old, and he's 30 and 3. He has 22 knockouts. Uh, his three losses, he's been knocked out in all three, three of those losses. Uh, three times he's been knocked out. Three losses, been knocked out three times. So they feel they picked the right guy. I, I went and did my due diligence and looked at tape of Lawson. Lawson's a guy, funny, he's a fighter. He's going to engage him, and that's what they want. He's going to engage him. We already know he can be hurt. He's going to engage him. And Virgil Ortiz, hopefully, is going to do what he did before the layoff, before he got sick. He's aggressive. He he, he loves the left hook. He, he's, a, he's got a PhD in going to the body. He's a terrific, not only a terrific body puncher, he's a dedicated body puncher. To be a great body puncher, you have to be dedicated to being a great body puncher. He's dedicated to being a great body puncher. Uh you know, he, he throws some big shots, some looping shots once in a while. Uh, left hook, left hook is really his uh, Sunday punch, if you will. That's his forte. Uh, he had doubled up to the, he'd go to the body, he'd go to the head, he'd go to the head, he'd go to the body. He had turned it into an uppercut sometimes. He's an exciting young kid. Uh, I think I, I'll give you a prediction. Everybody, we started off the show by me laughing at myself about how I made those bad picks uh, to finish 2024. I'll make a good one here. I not only pick uh, Ortiz to win, which isn't hard to do, but I'll pick how he's going to win and what round he's going to win. I'm going to say he's going to win by left hook to the liver, and I'm going to say it's going to come in the fourth round. That's it. So uh, I'm anxious to see him back. I want to. I want to see him back. I want to see him, as I said already, healthy. He looks like a good kid. He really a dedicated kid to the sport. I was reading some stuff about him where even when he was sick the first time with the attacks of COVID, he kept training. I mean, uh, you know, he he refused to leave the gym. It got so bad. Obviously, they had to finally get him the hell out of the gym and he wound up later on being hospitalized with 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 different things but um he he was still he was actually still training uh through some of his bouts with COVID because he had he he wound up contracting COVID more than one time so anyway he's he's a dedicated kid he's back uh let's see how he looks they don't have a money line on him. The people, the, the the guys at my bookie, they don't have a money line on this fight, but they do have an over under. Under five and a half rounds is minus 135, over five and a half plus 105. So I guess you're on the under there laying 135, under five and a half rounds. I am. I'm going to lay it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of the money that was in my stocking. Yeah, I got a little bit of, you know, I, I got rid of the coal. The coal is gone, but, but there was some money mingled in there with the call i'm going to take that money and i'm going to put it on the under and you can take virgil ortiz actually they, they didn't have a money line straight up on the fight but you can bet a few different props so virgil ortiz by knockout minus 800 and listen ken you just segued me into something real quick you're talking about gambling aspects of things really does there have to be a Full blown. I always talk about the corruption of boxing. I want to show people how how well leveled I am. That that I, I I talk about wherever there's corruption, wherever there's something wrong. That's just a boxing. How please? Is there anyone out there going to argue with me that there should be a full? There won't be, but there should be a full investigation in football about the way that game ended with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, the the other night, what was it? Saturday night. They made Monday night football. It drives me they crazy made Monday that night they football can't after the uh, fact. Oh, say God. that was the last play of the game. It affected the outcome. It was obviously a mistake. Reverse it. Monday night football. Saturday night they put it on because they don't want to go up against the college games and everything that the national champion games are getting ready t tonight. Uh, and I'll make a quick prediction on that for you guys. I like. I like Michigan over Alabama, even though Dr. Brown's going to be very upset at me because he's uh, he's an Alabama man and his daughter is a cheerleader for Alabama. So I'd like to see him win. But if I got to make a pick, I'm picking Michigan. I think it's their year. And I'm picking Washington State. I think the best team, not the best talent, but the best team, just team, baby, uh, you know, 
Their, their hole is better than their parts. Their hole is better than their tarts. Go ahead, parts. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you mean it's Washington over Texas? I'm sorry. I meant Washington. I'm thinking state. I don't know. Yeah, uh, not Washington. Yeah, I'm, state. I'm thinking of all the places you go. You were in Washington State last night. So, um, so Washington <laughs> over Texas. I'm, I'm taking them. They're undefeated. I think there's some is better than their parts. Uh, Texas probably has more explosive athletes, but at the end of the day, I'm going to take the underdog. I think they're getting five points. I'm going to take Washington, and then I'm going to lay the two points and take Michigan over the great Crimson Tide. But getting back to the Saturday-Monday night game that was on Saturday night, uh, a special, you know, they put it in there, special. I, I, I really... There should be a full investigation. I'm sorry. There really should. If that didn't look like it touched on corruption, where you you got, yeah, I mean, really, it's unbelievable. You got Dallas. Uh, who 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 was it that uh, they were playing? Dal Detroit. Yeah, you got the Detroit, Detroit Lions, who's had a great year. Great year. Uh, the coach has done a great job, and and Dallas probably has a little more talent, maybe. Uh, but they they're winning the the the. It's a great game. Detroit great scores game. and they're down by yeah. one, so they can kick one extra point and tie the game. But they're in Dallas. This coach yeah. is known for that. A, this coach is a riverboat gambler. He's a he's an animal. He's a good coach. My son says he's good. I believe in him. Dan Campbell. I believe in him. My son said he's good. He's good. My son's the best guy out there in, in the NFL. The one thing to point out, Teddy, before you give the rest, is that they they got a touchdown, so they're down by one with like less than a minute to go. They could kick a one, they could kick and tie. But remember, you're in Dallas on the road. Anytime you can escape with a win on the road is good. So he was like, you know what? This might be the closest we can get. Let's went roll for the, the dice. If we get two, we win. If we get, if we kick the extra points, sure, we can play more. But we're not going to get as close as the three-yard line. All the chips are on the table. They had the perfect trick play drawn up with the tackle eligible. Go ahead. Look, 20. As a matter of fact, it was 23 seconds left, I believe. And uh, so they first, before they got to that play, they actually, before they got to that play, they Dallas caught a timeout and it, and it looked like they were going to score. They were going to get the two point. Yep. Dallas caught a smart timeout, saw what they were doing, and and it and they didn't get to do that. I think they would have scored right there. So now after the timeout, they come back with the trick play, and you it turned out to be an offensive tackle went out for the pass. You have to report into the officials that you're eligible, and they have to report it. And he did. You saw it on videotape. He reported in. He <laughs> reported in. Hey, 100%. he didn't go over to the... This tackle walked over to the official out of the huddle to the official with someone else, and he... And he the quarterback and, and he, told him, yeah. get over there and And report. he talked to him. He wasn't asking him how his day was going. I guarantee you that. <laughs> he wasn't saying, hey, listen, I hope you and your family. It's very obvious when the tackle approaches the referee that he's reporting as tackle eligible. It's like not even up for debate. Yeah. So he goes over. He reports it. We Video proof. Video proof. The whole world saw it. He reports it. And they execute the play beautifully. He he fakes the block. Then he then he then he goes out. You know he just he he just shuffles out into the end zone after the fake block. And he's wide open. The the quarterback hits him with the pass. He catches it. You know three hundred pound tackle whatever. He catches the pass. Touchdown. They're gonna win the game. Well, there's still twenty three seconds. Okay, but they right now they. They were they were ahead with twenty three seconds to go. They're up by one point, and all of a sudden, and no flag. All of a sudden, five seconds, six seconds late. There's a flag. Oh wait, what's this? All of a sudden, the official says he didn't report in. Really fishy business. Illegal touching. Yeah, yeah really fishy business. Really, really makes you wonder. It really does because. All of you know, you got brains in your head. Yeah, you know a grandfather, you know an uncle, you know a father. Somebody told you, probably, if you went to, you know, watching sports as a as a kid, somebody probably said, hey, the easiest guy to really pay off and, and to fix a game would be the official. All he had to do is throw a flag at the right time or the wrong time. Throw a flag at the right time, the wrong, and, and, and you control the game. You, you can fix a game. And, you know, you always heard that. You say, yeah, 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 the NFL's button up. They don't let that happen. But how many times have you watched games, guys, 
where you just say, I didn't see that flag. Where'd that flag come from? Where did that come from? Or where you don't see a flag after you did see a flag early in the game. And all of a sudden you see a, a penalty and say, oh, gee, he missed it. Did he miss it? Did he miss it? Or did he want to miss it? So, I, I, look, I, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist uh, and, and, and I'm not jealous because I want to share the corruption with everyone, you know, just because I know my sport has plenty of corruption. I want to spread it to football, you know. I'm, I'm not trying to do that to you. But there's certain things that are, you have to look at and you have to ask the question. That was something you had to look at and you had to ask the question. The thing that drives me crazy on that is they have replay. They have people in New York watching. This is a prime uh, time yeah. game. In Dallas. Why they wouldn't you just You touched go, on it. In Dallas. Let's take a look at this. He's reporting in. Okay. How about just saying, hey, the ref on the field made a mistake. We're not going to look. This, this affects the outcome of the game right on the spot. Take as much time as you need to review it with the office in New York. Get Goodell involved if you have to and say we can't have a game decided because a referee made a mistake. Because it's clearly a mistake. Jerry Jones is probably the most powerful man in football. The most powerful owner yep. of all the owners. And... uh they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to rain on, on Jerry's party. Whatever. Look, whatever. I'm sure. Go go and look at what Stephen A. Smith has to say about it because I'm sure he's going to have some really interesting stuff to say about it. And, and the thing is, they, they have such control of the league. It's, it's really scary almost because everyone's afraid to say what they feel because the first thing out of the coach's mouth, the first thing out of the player's mouth, the first thing out of the other guy's mouth was... I, I got to be careful because I'll get fined. Uh, I know I'm probably going to get fined already even for saying anything uh, because they, they, they'll find the crap out of you uh, if, if you say anything. So they got you under this gag order where you can't say anything. And then here's the thing. Here's the real thing that finally really got to piss you off a little bit. Instead of letting the referee be available to questions, right, Ken? Let him be available at the yep. post for a uh, post. Uh, game press conference and and be available to questions. Hey, what, explain to us how you say that he didn't report when we see video of report. What did he do? No, you're not allowed to talk to him. No interviews with him. And they put out a cold, a cold answer on a piece of paper on something like this. Look, 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 look. Yeah, yeah. I got paper. You, you wonder if I got paper? I got paper. They he wrote. They wrote an explanation on a paper and handed that out. Uh, a cold piece of paper where you couldn't re re rebuttal. You couldn't rebuttal. Yeah, he, just a cold piece of paper explaining what he did, and that's it. And there was plenty of things on that cold piece of paper to question. Plenty of them to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Uh, that's it. Goodbye. Next game. Playoffs. Let's go, baby. <laughs> crazy um all right that sums up that wraps up what we had uh the fights we wanted to break down from um last week and what we have coming up next week let's talk about the 2023 year in review let's give out some best ofs if you like let's start with um let's start with fight of the year who was the fight of the year which one and I would argue that without knowing what your picks are, that we could actually pick a men's and a women's because there's a women's fight that was like as good as any you're going to see in terms of action, at least. Yeah, yeah, Katie Taylor. Katie Taylor and, and, and her exactly. rematch with Cameron. Uh, yeah, yeah, tremendous, tremendous. But I'm going to stick to the men right now and don't yep. attack me for it, please. Um, <laughs> but uh, I love the women, but, you know, I'm going to stick to the men right now. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can see a little better. I hope I don't freak anyone out with my eyes. <laughs> I, I really don't want to. I've tried to be a gentleman. Of, and I do. I, I try to be a gentleman. Um, and I'll put on these things that are, that are covered up a little. And, uh, all right, fight of the year. There's always going to be some honorable mentions. There was a few really good fights. Uh, you know, there was... Uh, there, there was a few good ones. But for me, I'm going to go with Espinosa winning the title over Ramirez. That was a hell of a fight. And oh, Espinosa, yeah. Ken, 
He was a man possessed that night. He gets dropped in the fourth. He was winning the first four. He gets dropped in the fourth by the favorite, big favorite, actually. Could have been upset in the year, too. Uh, Ramirez, who's, you know, who's the world champion, two-time gold medalist from the Olympics, and uh, Southpaw. And he drops. As we know, he's having a, it's very tall. He's like, for that weight class, what weight class is that? Is that uh, it's a small one? You look up the weight class for me. But he's very tall. He's like six foot one or so. He controls the outside, but he also fighting on the inside. And Ramirez is turf. Uh, he, he's fighting because he's a fighter, Espinosa. He's a fighter. And he's fighting on the outside. Even though 126. He, yeah. Featherweight 126. He's huge. I don't know if he's six foot or whatever he is. And he's fighting on the inside. Outside first four rounds. Then he goes inside. He gets caught. He gets dropped by Ramirez. The bell saves him, quite frankly. And then he gets shake it up again in probably around the seventh round or whatever. And then he just takes over. He just it doesn't take over. It's a back and forth fight. It's a tremendous ebb and flow fight. But he just And he's six one to your point. Yeah. And he just makes up his mind, Ken. He ain't leaving the freaking ring without the title. You hear people say it? He really did it. He really put his words where his mouth was. And he was leaving on the shield like they say. He really was. And he just wasn't even leaving on the shield. He was not leaving unless he had that belt. And it was a great fight. And Ramirez was great. He was great. And it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then when I use the words man possessed, I use them for, I choose those words for a reason. Espinosa really was. In a 12th round, he just was relentless. He was an unstoppable force. He made himself an unstoppable force, physically and mentally. He refused, and he just kept going and going and going. And Ramirez is great as Ramirez. Ramirez is great mentally, emotionally, heart, physically, everything. He's great. And Espinosa just would not relent. And he finally drops Ramirez. He was like breaking him down. It was incredible. And he finally stops, drops Ramirez close to the bell. Again, both guys got saved by the bell. Fourth round, Espinosa got dropped, saved by the bell. Twelfth round, Ramirez gets dro uh, dropped, saved by the bell. And if there was 10 seconds more in that round, Espinosa would have stopped him. As good as Ramirez is. Yep. Because he just, like I said, he was just unstoppable. He was like that train with uh, Denzel Washington, that movie. Unstoppable. <laughs> he yeah. was unstoppable. And you see those guys sometimes. Uh, and, you know, you don't see them too often. But I saw it that night. So he gets fight of the year. And, and look, this uh, Devonchenko and Mugia was tremendous. You know, uh, I forget the other one from from across the pond. What was it? Cordina and Rachmanov. Yeah, that was great. And, and Haney Lomachenko. Well, Wood, Wood. Yeah, that was great. Oh, I think you're thinking of Louis uh, Neary versus uh, Hoven. Yeah, Hoven that was great. But there was another one. Wood. It was Wood and uh, Warrington. Yeah, that was a great fight. That was a great fight. Hell yeah. There were so many good ones. I guess the point is. Yeah. But for me, Espinosa Ramirez, what's the next category we're going to cover? Next category, we have Trainer of the Year. All right, here I'm going to throw, a, I'm going to throw one that's off the radar. Uh, Bo Mack would be the easy one to pick, and I have no problem. Bo Mack, I love him. He's always got his fight. Him and his team, they all do a good job, but he's always got his guy ready to fight the right fight. Always, and I notice it. Yep. doesn't get missed on Teddy Atlas. I notice it. Always know what to do. The style, the the approach. He, his charges are always ready to fight the right fight. And so Bo Mack, of course, trains the pound for pound number one fight in the world. Crawford, who I think is number one in the world, along with in a way. They're interchangeable, the two of them. But anyway, he trains Crawford, who took apart Spence. Uh, 
and and then he also took over the training of Eubank across the pond. I love That's you right. guys across the pond. Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, he took over the training of Eubank for his rematch with uh, Liam Smith after Smith had had won their first fight, had stopped him, and and yep. what happens? He flips it around, and Eubank dominates the fight. So he did a great job. He also has the nine and zero prospect Keyshawn Davis, who's a silver medalist oh, yeah. from the Olympics. Uh, he's also training him. So look, Bomack easily could be train of the year, but I'm gonna go a little, a little off the you know off radar, like I said, off the ranch a little bit, and I'm gonna give it to Inouye's father, Shingo Inouye. How could he not be recognized at some point for doing the job he does with his son? And he's also got another son. I was hoping that's where and, you were going. Yeah, with Ken. That one, and and for I the people too. out there, for the people out there that are gonna say he only has one fighter, he's also got another son who's a top fighter. I think he's fighting for a world title soon. He's also got another time, not as good as anyway. Who could be as good as anyway? Uh, you know, the the one I'm talking about. But No, yeah. Uh, he's got another son who's, I think it'll be fighting for a title, who's very good. And who reminded me of that was my partner on Pro Box, uh, one of my partners on Pro Box, Paulie Malinati, who does a brilliant job. And and Chris Algieri, they, they do a brilliant job. But anyway, he reminded me of that. And so he don't have just one fighter. He And even if he had only one, I don't care. He deserves to be thought about for trade of the year, just like just the like brother, the brother, the brother's name is Takuma Inoue, and he's got the WBA bantamweight title. There it is. He got the title already, and and then I didn't think he had it. I thought he was fighting for it, so he has it. And now he reminds me. The father reminds me of Lomachenko's father, studious guy. Matter of fact, I'm going to go deeper. Studious guy, obviously. Uh, very cerebral, very very good with technique and everything, preparation. Uh, reminds me of Lomachenko's father, who also won train of the year one time, but deservingly so. And he only trains one fighter. For those who want to argue with me about the merit of giving it to a guy with one fighter. <laughs> but I, I'm going to say something that, that my man Ken's going to love. Really, Ken, you're going to love it. Shingo Inoue's father is a great marathon runner. He he's in his forties, oh, and he can he has show you how great you are. You have run a marathon under two hours and thirty minutes, like two twenty eight, right? Somewhere in that neighborhood. Yes. Well, his, yep. his best time is a little less than yours. Not quite as good as yours. He's younger than you too, but but it's an unbelievable time. It's like two twenty nine, whatever it is. It's, 229.12. He ran that in 2013 at the Katsuta See what Marathon. you learn here, Ken? You uh, learn a lot here. You crazy. learn a lot here. You learn more than just boxing. And not only that, but you're going to love this even better, Ken. He has run in those ultra marathon, ultra iron, uh, iron races, whatever the hell. Ultra marathon. Yeah. He ran 100 kilometers in 70205. What is that? So 100 That's kilometers, 100, 62 I mean, miles. He has... 62-ish. Uh, so he's running those kind of Ironman, you know, type races, ultra marathons, races where you're running hundreds of miles. Um, By the way, 229.12 for a marathon. Now, this was 10 years ago for him, so maybe he was in his 30s, but 229.12 wins the majority of the marathons that are ever run in the world. We think of it because... Because we see the Boston, New York, where they're running close to two hours, we think that that's the, what the winning time is. But if you go in and run the, uh, I won the Myrtle Beach Marathon in 2.30.25, but 2.29.12 would win 90% of the marathons run in the world. That is a freaking fast time. That's basically 5.40 per mile for 26 miles. So 42 kilometers, whatever it is for the uh, Europeans, that's fast. That's real Listen, fast. Listen, I had to bring that up. I'm to, to especially in your wheelhouse, I knew that you would you would be moved by that. You would be you know you, you'd be awakened by that, and <laughs> and look a little deeper in that computer, Ken. I think he ran a crazy race like you did in the desert one time. I think he ran one of yeah. these crazy races that was like over a hundred miles. Do you see something there? It was some kind of crazy race. 
And he, he won the Tour de Taiwan Ultra Marathon in April 2013 with a time of one, 109 hours and 25 minutes. So I'm guessing that he did like a multi-day race. Yeah, it was. At a time. That's what it says, but I'm maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it looks like that's what it is. No, no, you're not. I think it was over 100 miles. Yeah. All right, that's next on my list of things to do. We're winning. It. We're gonna win a hundred mile race this year for the fight at, for the fight with Teddy Atlas. Is. Team race, hundred miles. Every race I do, I think of as a team race. I represent my people every well, time I run, including as well. the fans, whether they believe it or not. So any argument we're giving it to in a way, especially after that, Ken. Uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, I don't think they're. I'm gonna give it to him for 24 too, and I'm gonna, yeah, and I'm gonna. Give, I thought you would, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna give another honorable mention out there besides you know I mentioned Bomack, which is very deserving. Um, I'm gonna give another one to Andy Lee, the former world champion who trains yep. uh, undefeated prospect Patty Donovan, and also trains, of course, uh, Joe Parker, who just pulled off an enormous upset. Uh, with Wilder. So I'm going to put him in there. So what's the next category? Well, speaking of um, prospects and... um, Speaking of prospects, why don't we go to... um, Well, we have prospect of the year and upset of the year. You mentioned both. Which one would you prefer? Uh, Start Well, we've got both, but we're going to start with... Each one has their own, you know, their own person, their own category. Let's start with prospect. So we'll go with prospect. All right. That's do a lot of people. I'm going to get you to learn more fighters out there instead of just the ones you see on ESPN. All right. Or on the zone or whatever. This one actually fights on, on pro box. They put on competitive fights. And talk. I'm not going to go crazy because I work for them. So I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to go, but I hope you trust my reputation, my track record enough out there over 50 years in this business, where I am not going to sell myself. I haven't yet. I'm not going to start doing it now. I'm not going to say anybody if I don't believe they're the right person and they deserve it to be said, whatever, whatever it is. And I'm not going to knock somebody unless they deserve to be knocked, no matter what it is. So this is a fighter who fights on pro box television. You guys should check it out. That's all I'm going to, I think it's on every Wednesday, other Wednesday, whatever. I don't even know. But his name is Naji Lopez. I watched him. He's 9-0 with eight knockouts. He's a really real... I'll put him in with any prospect out there. Any prospect out there that fights on the zone, you know, fights on uh, ESPN, uh, used to fight on PPC, whatever. The, well, now they're gone with Showtime, but they're going to go over to Amazon. I will put Nashi Lopez with Eddie Ken. Great technique, knows how to fight. He's got power. He throws all snappy, short, explosive punches. Uh, I'm not sure of his weight. I think it's light heavyweight, but he's a good inside uh, fighter. He was tested in a fight where I watched him, where he showed me the mental toughness. He got stunned by a good shot. He behaved like a fighter. Uh, like I said, he, he showed me more than just what's on the outside. He showed me what's on the inside, uh, his character. He throws Joe Lewis like short, crispy punches on the inside. He's fun to watch. Prospect of the year, baby. Georgia native. Uh, nine and zero with eight knockouts. Twenty four years old, six foot two. Uh, let me get you the exact weight here. He is campaigning at light heavyweight. Um, let me see if they got last fight was uh, December thirteenth. So look for something. We'll look for his uh, next fight to be announced. Nothing scheduled yet, but yep, has all certainly has all the makings. Doing what he has to do, right? With nine wins and eight of them by knockout at light heavyweight for a prospect, you want to see that knockout to win percentage very high. Big guys, interesting. All right, well, let's get into upset of the year. You mentioned Joseph Parker earlier. Uh, what do you got for upset of the year? Honorable mentions. You can't go wrong with Wilder losing to Parker. Parker beating him, right? As I said earlier. 
you know, my fight of the year could be my upset of the year. Espinosa beating a big favorite in Ramirez. I'm with you there. Yeah. Hard not to give yeah. him that. No, that 100%. was even, Ramirez should have by on paper should have killed him. They you know his handlers thought he was gonna white whitewash this guy. Hundred percent, Ken. But I'm gonna go with something a little off again, off the ranch. Okay, off a little bit off the reservoir, uh, re, uh, reservation, if you will, right? <laughs> not, uh, we're not going to drown anybody in the reservoir. We're going to go off the reservoir. <laughs> okay, people love when I do that. So I give so it shows you, <laughs> including me. Shows you nothing's changing from 2023 to 24. <laughs> I'm still going to make those little whatever they are. All right. Here it Full is. Pause. Here it is. You ready? Drum roll, please. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. It's actually a guy who lost, but I don't give a damn. It's the upset of the year. And Ganyu going the distance in a competitive fight with the heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury. I love this and, pick. And, uh, I, I, I don't care. Nothing was more shocking, I don't think, to boxing fans anyway. It hits all the criteria, checks all the boxes for upset of the year. Cross all the criteria. Nobody expected it, right? He's supposed to have no chance. Definitely His not. first pro fight ever, boxing match, right? His first pro boxing match ever, ever. He fights a decent guy? No, he fights the heavyweight, undefeated heavyweight <laughs> champ of the world, right? Suppose, lineal suppose, champ. Lineal champ. Suppose they have no chance. No chance. And what does he do? He not only goes to distance and he's competitive, but he drops him. He drops him. That checks the final box for me. He drops him in the third round. And I, he lost the fight. He lost in fan square. A lot of people say, oh, he really won. The no, he lost. Uh, he, there was a lot of dead rounds there. There was a lot of non-active rounds. And, and Fury outjammed him and, you know, knew how to win those rounds. But he won the night. He might not have won the fight, but he won the night. He, uh, it was an upset. There were people saying he won the fight. So for me... I always think outside the box anyway, but I didn't have to go far outside the box to come up with that. And Ganyo, my upset of 2023. Love it. That's a great pick. Um, knockout of the year. Who had the big, biggest and best knockout of the year, Teddy? Again, some people are going to be aware of this. Go Google, baby. Go look these guys up. You know, it's not in a weight class where a lot of you... May, may be venturing over and watching, but it was for the world light flyweight title, 108 pounds to be exact. And it was for the world title. It was also a big upset, also a big upset. But it was the KO of the year for me. Adrian Curiel knocks out the champion, Serventi Nanshinga. Nanshinga. He knocks him out. Here's what makes it even more special, Ken. <laughs> Not only is it an uh, uh, upset, he's, he's a big underdog. The guy, I don't have his record. Maybe you could find it. But let's just say he had 20 fights, uh, Curiel. He only had four knockouts. He was not a banger. He was not a puncher. Never was. And what do I always say? It's not only the power. It's about the delivery system. Landing clean. If you can land the punch where a guy don't see it because of your your IQ in the ring because of your delivery system, you're going to hurt a guy. You're going to hurt a guy bad if you can hit him with it, even if you don't have power or big power. And that's what he did. And he hurt him. He knocked him cold. What a punch. And again, the technique, the delivery system by a guy who's not known as a puncher. Adrian Curiel, what's he do? He slips. He did something that I teach. On my videos, dynamic striking. Uh, excuse me for being such a, what do you call it, uh, a self-promoter. Shameless self-promoter. <laughs> I don't do it too often. But I got to say, I show this one in the dynamic striking instructional videos that are out there on dynamicstriking.com. Where you want to trick a guy, you want to set a guy up, you want to hit him with a punch you don't see, and you're an orthodox fighter which is what Curio was, you slip to your left, and as you slip it to your left, you get his eyes to follow you, which they will. So as you're slipping your upper body to your left, 
simultaneously you throw the right hand on the right side. So you slip it to your left, boom. Just a slight delay, fraction, boom. Just enough of a delay where his eyes go over to the other side to follow your upper body, and he never sees the right hand land on the chin, and that is exactly what happened. Savanti Nanshinga never saw the right hand from Adrian Curiel that knocked him out and took the belt away from him and gave the world light flyweight title to Curiel. It, that that's why now there's a few there's a few honorable mentions out there first of all is what did you want to what did you want me to look up on curiel it was uh, a second round ibf his title, record like his fly. record i know he only had four knockouts uh curiel was 24 four and one 23 four and one going into the fights but he only had five there knockouts and did he have five or four? Did he have 12, five or four? Maybe, maybe it's adding five. Yeah, sorry. He had four coming in, and that was the fifth. That was his fifth knockout. So, wow. Only four knockouts in 23 pro wins. Yeah. Not a big no, puncher. No, to my point, and um, honorable mention, O'Quinn on the zone, O'Quinn knocked out McGraw uh, again. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah, that was a good one, one Ken. And and again, O'Quinn had no was supposed to have no chance. He was getting beat up. He was mm-hmm. losing every second of every round. He was supposed to really have no chance. And uh Oh yeah, and the announcers were letting you know too. They were basically like, Oh, this is a whitewash, they should maybe stop the fight. They were they were they didn't see and that I'll one give coming. You, but that's happened before. Give, oh yeah. I'll give you two others. Mickey Ward. Mendoza versus Fedora. That was a great one. Oh and that that was man, that was painful that, to watch. That, I like that was Fentura. a great one with the big six foot five guy. And then I'm curious to see if Fedora could come back from that. I really am. And yeah. and I'm with yeah. you. And then the other one was just recent, Ken. And man, oh 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 Fallon Swell and Oxal Colbert. We talked about it on our air. What was it, a yep. week ago? Uh, we talked about two oh, weeks yeah. ago. Knocked Maybe them silly. it was two weeks ago. He knocked him. Oh, he knocked him cold. It was the rematch where Valenzuela got robbed in the first fight with Colbert. But anyway, they had the rematch, and uh, Colbert didn't leave it to the judges. I mean, uh, Valenzuela, I'm sorry, didn't leave it to the judges. He knocked Colbert cold. He he caught him. He's a southpaw, Valenzuela. And what he did was Colbert, he probably needs a new trainer, to be honest. He, he's, he makes too many mistakes Mechanic. I don't know if he's going to recover from this fight either. I said, I don't know if Fandora's going to recover. I don't know if Colbert could recover, really, to be honest. Uh, well, that knockout was also emphasized by the trash talking that Colbert did before, during, and after that fight. It's just not a good look when you're talking like that, disrespectful, 100%. and you get starched. No, you're right, Ken. And, and he... So I don't know if he'll recover. I don't know. But I'm just glad he didn't get hurt seriously. That's how bad the knockout looked. And again, the way it took place was Colbert just made a big no-no from a technical standpoint. You don't step back straight in front of your opponent. You just don't. Not tall, not high. And he stepped straight back with his hands loose. And Valenzuela did what you're supposed to do. He stepped where he's a southpaw. He stepped with him with the right hook. Bang. Bang. And that was it. And it reminded me a little bit, I'm going to go back in time, you know, for the historians out there that really follow the sport that like when I do this. I'm going to go back. I want to test you guys out there. What fight, is, what fight was reminiscent of that knockout? And I'm going to give it to you. Think for, I'll give you five seconds to figure it out. Go ahead. That's all. All right. The fight that reminded me of that was, of course, two great fighters, not, not fighters of this level. Although Valenzuela, I, I'd love to see him win a world title. I love the kid. Hold on, let me I, take I, a I guess love... with the trash talk, and I'm going to go Caleb Plant and uh, Anthony Durrell. That's a good one. That's a hell of a guess. That's not the one I'm thinking about. I'm going back further. I'm going, because I said historian, oh. so historian, you got to go back more than six months. I'm going back years. <laughs> I'm going back years, okay? So that's a good one, though. That is a good one. Um, and that was a hell of a knockout. I'm gonna, and that was for the same reason, by the way. I, I'm gonna go with these. Like I said, these were top-notch fighters. It was for a world title. 
I'm going to go with, he was called the body snatcher. Mike McCallum, when he caught Donald Curry, who was a hell of a fighter. I think he was still undefeated, world champion, a hell of a fighter. He caught Donald Curry stepping out straight. And he stepped with him, caught him a hook, and uh, good night, Irene. You know, uh, basically, like uh, my f- former fighter who also does a great job with the commentator, Tim Bradley, uh, would sometimes say to me in the gym, good night, Irene. Or no, no, he didn't say good night, <laughs> Irene. What did he say? Uh, oh, golly, Miss, what, what's, what is it? Uh, oh, golly, Miss that Molly. Was, uh, I think that's the one he said. Oh, golly, Miss Molly. <laughs> Something like that. My my grandson says it every once in a while. Um, I, I'm so blessed. I got three grandchildren. Uh, four grandchildren, I'm sorry. I got a new one who's going to be six months old. Little Adeline, my daughter just gave us. A uh, little girl, beautiful, beautiful. I don't know how these kids, my kids do it. They, I guess it's from their mother. They they do nothing but make beautiful kids. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I got, I got Adeline. I have Joseph. Uh, my man, <laughs> Joseph. I got Joseph. He's just turned six. I got little Teddy the fourth. He's unbelievable. He's five. And I got, oh, I got, I got the tough one. I got the tough one, Mara. Mara is four, and <laughs> she's she is so, oh, she's great. But she's tough. You better not miss, you don't <laughs> miss step with. That's the most diplomatic answer I've ever heard. How would you describe her? I, she's really tough. You know, you know she's you tough. Don't, you don't miss step with Miss Mara. You do not miss step with Miss Mara. If she's not in the mood, you come in the kitchen, you say, good morning, Mara. Just look, look. She'll go like this. She'll catch she, you she just look at you like this. And then walk, and walk, <laughs> and just walk off. Just, just walk off. All right, Miss Mara, not today. Not today. I'll try again later. <laughs> anyway, that's the year of 2023. I think it was a good caps capsulation. I got one more. We didn't. We didn't do. We did fight of the year, but we haven't given out the coveted, most cherished fighter of the year. Who's your fighter of the year for 23, Teddy? I'm so glad you didn't let that get missed. Really, I and again a lot of competition. The most, I think, the easiest one to maybe no, not only easy. They're all great, and they're all deserving. I think one of the ones that, if you went by a certain, you know, certain, just a certain calculus, if you will, a uh, certain metric, you would go with in a way. You can't go wrong. Because he had two wins. You have to. He unified yeah, he has two, two weight two wins classes. Over Fulton and Tapolis. You're right. 100%. Ful- Fulton uh, was the number one fighter uh, at 122. Ken, Ken I'm so glad you said it that way. But I'm not going with him. And, and, and I just said it, <coughs> but I'm not going with him. I'm going to go, and um, again, if, I'm not afraid to go You know, against the, uh, the, against the grain. But... And for me, it's not going against the grain. I, I don't care. But in a way, it's great. You can't go wrong. I'm giving it to Crawford. I know he only had one fight, but what a fight. What a fight. i say it again. What a performance. He not only beats Spence, but he destroys him, takes him apart. And not only that, he takes apart a guy who's pound for pound in the top four or five in the world. Many people had him number one. Uh, yes. Undefeated, pound for pound in the, in the world. And and nobody else beat a pound for pound top guy. Nobody. In a way, beat really good fighters. Don't get me wrong. Really good. And I give him all his flowers. But Crawford, Crawford, Crawford. Oh, my Crawford. He, he beats... Pound for power to the top guys, and oh, how he beats them. Oh, my goodness. He puts a clinic on in every category, in every dimension of how you would describe a great fighter. I think he changed a lot of people's perspective about him and about Spence. I think it was so shocking to people. They were like, wow, either Crawford's so much better than we thought, or Spence isn't on the same level, or a little bit of both. 
But I don't think he, Spence is held nearly in the same regard after that fight. One performance. Uh, you know what? That's I'm so glad to. You're you're hot today. You're hot, kid. You're hot. You're hot. You're having a big day. You are. <laughs> I'm so glad you you brought that up because I mentioned a couple of fights. You know that we did today. That I don't know if those guys are going to recover from their losses. Here's another one. Here's another one. I I don't know if Spence recover. I hope he does. That's I hope exactly he does. What I was thinking of his people. Hope he does. Spence. He recovered from a could have been a tragic car accident, horrific car accident, where he. F- but I would argue to that point, Teddy. I would argue, did he? That, that's a good point. I don't point. think he's looked the yeah. same as he. A lot of people go. See, I don't want to take that another away from Crawford by speculating in that category. I mean, in that area. That's but fair. but I but what's fair is also what you said. That's fair too. That's fair too. That that was that. Was that the Crawford we knew before the accident? Was that the Crawford we knew before the accident? The one that got in there with, uh, not Crawford, I'm sorry. Was that the Spence. Spence we knew before the accident, before he got in there with Crawford? I don't know. We, we, we think it was, but who knows? All we know is that Crawford took him apart and uh, Crawford is in his own galaxy, as in a way is. Definitely. That's right. That's a good job. That was a good show. I, is there anything else there, sir, that we... I would say that we would at least give an uh, honorable mention to Devin Haney. I think what he did this year was impressive, too. That's fair. I mean, the way he beat my man That's Regis fair. was... Whew, I didn't expect that to be so lopsided. I, I did. I thought it was going to be a one-sided fight. But but look, or well, that it had the potential to be. But... I, that's fair. That's 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 fair. Haiti's been active. He's you know for what active is today. Uh, back in the days that I talk about, the thirties, twenties, thirties, forties, guys fought. Oh my God, they they uh, they fought every three months. They fought every two months. Uh, they yeah. fought every month. I mean, could you look up real quick for me on that subject, Ken? <laughs> could you look up? You were Rob. Also, I want to say Happy New Year to our whole team, to Rob, too, Rob, <coughs> who does a great, uh, Moore, who does a great, great job producing this, and Sam Rivera, who's here with me every week, doing a great job. But could you look up, Rob Moore, I want to say his name right, could you guys look up how many times Henry Armstrong fought uh, back in the day when he was, when, when he was, uh, you know, when he was fighting, he was a three-division champion. Featherweight, full division, no junior, no junior, and only one champion back in the day. He was a full featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight champ, and should have been a full middleweight. Well, he ended his career, for what it's worth, 149, 21, and 10, but I'll go back towards the beginning and see how many yeah, Some of his fights aren't in posted. Year. I hate to say it. He has more than that. 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 But just take a look at one of his years, active years, just just for the fun. Like now, if a champion fight, he's a champion. In, if a in, champion, let me say, 19- let me qualify. Let me just set it up. If a champion fights now twice a year, oh wow, he's active. Go ahead. Go ahead. In thirty in 1937, he fought 15 oh. times in his first year as oh, a pro. Oh. Go ahead. Go past that though. When, when he started fighting really, you know, well, he was always fighting tough guys. Well, in, in 1938, from January until March 30th, he fought 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times in three months. <laughs> so, But they were all tough fights. They were all tough fights. 15 rounders, back-to-back yeah, 15 rounders. In, in August of 38, he fought a 15-rounder for the title against Lou Ambers. Yeah, great fighter, Lou Ambers. Uh, great fighter. Three months later, he fought another 15 rounds against Serafino Garcia, Seferino. He got robbed. They gave him a draw. That should have been his fourth full title that he won, and they gave him a draw because he wouldn't sign with the fellas. So, But he, he really won that fight, so he should have been a featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, and middleweight champ. So, But he was a featherweight, welterweight, uh, featherweight, lightweight, welterweight champion. He he defended all three titles simultaneously in about two and a half months. Nineteen thirty-seven. He fought twenty-seven times. 
27 times. And he had the greatest fighting name, nickname ever, Homicide Hank. At one point, you know, in 1933, he fought four, uh, sorry, three fights in a row that all went, he got a draw on all three of them. They were only four round fights against, uh, two of them were against Perfecto Lopez and Hoyt Jones, but three fights in a row ended in fourth round draws. Just an interesting stat. All right, before we close out, uh, and start, you know, with our first show of the year, we close it out. We close out everything we did cover in 2023. One thing I know you was kind of in your craw. Real fast, real fast, let's just touch on uh, what was in your craw about about this ridiculousness with the belts, uh, you know, that never seems to stop with these alphabet organizations. They upgraded Tank Davis, and uh, his new name is Abdul, uh, but for now, we'll say Tank Davis. Everyone knows who we're talking about. They upgraded him. I mean, it's it's just another... It sounds so absurd. Go ahead. They announced that Javante Davis is now the sole WBA lightweight world champion after Devin Haney vacated it when he moved up to um, fight uh, Regis. And uh, Haney previously held the super, while Tank held the lesser recognized regular belt. But what I was saying to you guys on the on a text earlier is like it it it's you're you're the organization you have a champion why would you diminish the the achievement of your champion by giving someone a regular title or any well, other title point, for that you know what matter? they call the title now seriously they call it an email title they do no seriously <laughs> I'm telling you the people out there in the know. In the business, the real fans, the people, they say he got an email title. Email, he got an email to him. I mean, it's absurd. It's not enough that there's four titles. Now they're going to each have a regular and a super and a franchise. It's kind of embarrassing. And it diminishes the actual champion. And it's one of the reasons why I'm not going to go on it heavy. But it's one of the reasons why I'm trying to get a national commission. <laughs> Besides everything else that it would deal with. Everything, including a pension for the fighters. But besides, and, and getting honest refs, honest judges, you know, all of that, getting rid of the corruption. But besides that, it would get rid of these alphabet nonsense, these ranking, rating organizations that really have, it's absurd. They, they, they have too much power. All they do is collect sanction and fees. They favor certain fighters. They do business with certain managers, certain fighters. Um, it, it's... It's it's ridiculous, and they delete, they diminish the credibility of the sport. They delete, really diminish, really the importance of belts. Like they don't mean anything. All that matters is the public knows who the best fighter is. That's all I care about. I mean, these belts, these proliferation of belts, is out of control. It's just out of. There's a belt for everything. I mean, really, if you're going out tonight, there's a belt. If you're, if you're going to a dance, there's a belt. <laughs> if, if you're going you know, to the weight gym, there's a weight belt. All right, you put that belt on. You know, <laughs> if you're wearing dungarees, you wear another belt. If, you go, if you're wearing a tuxedo, you wear a cummerbund, and you got another belt. <laughs> uh, please, stop. Stop. It, 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 it does nothing but detract from the greatness of the sport. And what it's about, the fighters, the fighters in the ring. It does nothing but diminish what should be important, not this crap. It's really, it's just, who cares? The fans got to stand up. They got to stand up and say, I don't give a that's, freak. That's right. Really, I care about the fighter. I know who the champion is. I know who the best guy is. I don't need a belt to identify that. And, and not a belt. Three belts, four belts, 22 belts, 450 belts. I don't need that. I don't need that. It just takes that's away right. from what the attention of the sport should be. Who the best fighters are, period. Not who these ranking organizations tells you he's a silver champion, a half a silver, a gold champion, a copper champion, uh, a champion in waiting, a champion in remiss, demiss, uh, regress. Uh, I, uh, look, again, that's one of the things a national commission would do. It would get rid of this nonsense and get it back to the way it should be. Simple. For fans to know who the champion are. One champion. 
The only rating organization up until I get a national commission together, and I'll be damned if we're not going to get it done. But uh, with, with Pedro... With Pedro Martinez, with Keith Sullivan, with Dan Donovan, uh, former congressman, I I got a I got a team, I got a team looking to put this together. We're we're gonna meet with Congress. We're gonna get it together. We're gonna we're gonna get a a national commission. In the meantime, the only rank, rankings I would follow would be transnational. Ken, there's a ranking organization out there called Transnational. They're real. They got about 50 international writers who are unbiased. They're not connected to any fighters. They're not connected to any organizations. They're unbiased boxing writers across the globe, internationally. And they do this ranking, transnational rankings, and they do a good job. They, they do such a good job that if they think that a fighter gets robbed and they watch it and they say, and they have a board that votes on it, and they think that fighter got robbed, they're not going to drop him in the ranking. They're not going to drop. And if the fighter was a fighter who wasn't ranked as high as, you know, he wanted to be by winning the fight, he, he, he thought if he won the fight, he was going to go up in the rankings, but he gets robbed from, you know, from the house fighters, so to speak. You know what they do? They intercede, and they say, we don't care what the judges say. We see that he got robbed. We're going to move him up in the rankings. Even though he lost, we're gonna move on. That's the real deal. That's the, you know. Yeah. That's the real deal. So anyway, that's it. Well, Teddy, before we um, before we sign off, I want to get your quick thoughts. It looks like we're gonna get uh, uh, McGregor, Michael Chandler in July or in late June for International Fight Week. But before we do that, I want to just say quickly. Um, New Year is upon us. I started this thing on uh, Instagram. There's no affiliation. It's just a fun little challenge that I put out there, and a lot of people have responded to, responded to it. It's just a run challenge for people that are into fitness. I have a challenge that you just pick a distance, run that distance every day for the month of January. I've got like 500 people signed up. Again, there's nothing in it for me. I'm not promoting anything. Just trying to create some accountability and build some consistency rolling into the new year. So regardless of the weather conditions, get out there and run. I ran 4,000 miles last year, 366 runs in 365 days. So we're not here to make excuses. Just try and help each other get better. And one of the things that you can do while you're out there pushing your body is always supplement with athletic greens go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas a-t-l-a-s and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase again athletic greens is the all-in-one green drink made from whole food source ingredients one scoop in the morning is all you need for your body's health and immunity. Like I've said before, consider it an insurance policy for your own health and wellness. I can't say enough good things about this. If there was only one supplement I would take, speaking of marathon running and the great Shingo Inoue, I'm sure he's on the Athletic Greens as well. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the 10 free travel packs. Teddy, Chandler McGregor, what are your thoughts? Um, it's an interesting fight, explosive fight. Chandler's fights are always explosive. He goes for it all. He never, you know, he he's the KO, he's the KO artist. He's the guy who's the always, you know, he he's the gunslinger. He he's always looking to explode. He brings it all. You got to give him credit since he came over from the other organization over to uh, to UFC, the top organization. He's fought nothing but top guys. He's fought all time. And he's lost a few, obviously, but yeah. only to top guys, like our friend Dustin Poirier, you know, and always in shootouts. So it's going to be explosive. McGregor, the real question, he's a pioneer. He's one of the greats, one of the greatest counterparts, probably the greatest promoter of all time. He's up there with Muhammad Ali and, and Tyson Fury and those. Probably the, I mean, he, he's probably the greatest promoter of all time in the UFC. I don't think there's a question about that. Uh, but also a great fighter. Also a great fighter, great talent, great puncher, southpaw, great counterpuncher, great counterpuncher. And he beats up really good fighters. Really good fighters. And, you know, during that window when he was at his best, he was good. 
no matter how you hate him now, or you love him, you hate him because of the things he says, because of his actions, the things. That, I don't care. All I'm telling you is what you're talking about. A fight. He was tremendous. Uh, he's coming back from a devastating injury. He's been out a long time. It's got to be a couple of years now. I don't know exactly what the time period is. You could find him. I think it's 18 months. I think it was July of 22. Yeah, it's he, close um, to, I thought it was leg. close to two years. Um, a horrendous injury. <clears throat> you know, guys like Wildman, a great uh, Wideman, I should say, uh, he, he tried to come back from an injury like that. He, you know, he, he was tremendous, former champion. I don't think he was able to come back. Um, the, you know, it's hard to come back from an injury like that. And McGregor getting older, you know. Uh, it, it's an interesting fight on so many fronts. So many fronts. You know what? I think that that fight, Teddy, was July of 21, not 22. Does that sound right? Could it be two well, and a half years? Well, that's why originally when you, I said I thought it was, Does that I sound thought right? it was a couple of years. Wow. I didn't realize. that's a, Yeah, that was when he injured his leg. It was definitely July 10th of 21. Yeah, originally I thought a couple Man, years. So is, I'm, I'm, I'm not shocked. Yeah, two and a half yeah, years. So, I mean, that's, come on. That's a career for some people. So, uh a very interesting, a very interesting fight. Give McGregor credit again. He comes back. He ain't picking up. Not that UFC has any patsies, because I was going to use that terminology, <laughs> but uh, he ain't picking no easy. Again, there's no layups in the UFC, but a superstar like McGregor, and he's a superstar, and he still is, uh, and he's still the face of the sport. I think for the most part, even though you got guys like O'Malley who's been on our show, who who's coming forward to to be the next face, and you know a lot of great guys, but McGregor is still that face, and for him to take that fight, you gotta give him credit, uh, and you gotta give Chandler as always credit, and uh, and Chandler getting a chance to make a mega payday, which he deserves with all the monsters that he took since he came over from Bellator. He he sure as hell deserves it. Anyway, that that it's it's an interesting fight. God bless everyone. Happy New Year. Um, appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys for letting us come into your living rooms, your phones, your cars, where, wherever the heck you let us come into. Uh, without you, we can't do this. The day, if the day ever comes that you don't want us to do it, we won't do it no more because we only do it because <laughs> you want us to do it and you give us the privilege of doing it. So thank you to another big year. That's good. That's, we got 300,000 subscribers. People out there, you do everything I ask. I ask a little more. Get us up to 500,000. That's it. And for those who don't know, we're recording on uh, New Year's Day here because we're all business all the time. So we won't be sleeping in. We won't be taking it easy and ever. We're in here on New Year's Day grinding away, getting ready for the big games tonight. That's right. And as I say goodbye, I take my glasses, my shades off. I'm not big time with nobody. I take my glasses <laughs> off with my deformed eyes that I have and um, and I do this God bless Happy New Year everyone we'll see you soon